Ahoy! We're in Las Vegas at NAB 2023, and we're very excited to see what all of our friends at all of our favorite companies have been working on in this past year so that we as filmmakers can take our craft to all new levels. So let's hit the show floor and see what's new. So I filmed that intro on the show floor uh, when I planned to run around and report on all the cool new whiz bangery. Uh, but I quickly realized other people do that way better than I can, and uh, they're far more entertaining. So I decided to shift gears and bring you something completely different. Uh, what you'll find here are interviews, really extended conversations with some incredibly cool people uh, at some companies that I just admire deeply. Uh, and at the end of the day, we're all kind of just film nerds, uh, so this was an opportunity to nerd out with them. Uh, the coolest thing about NAB is meeting people, and it's really great to uh, see how all of these companies and the products that they make are deeply, deeply uh, uh, shaped by the personalities behind them. So that's what I think you'll find here. Uh, we talk about a lot of different things and get kind of philosophical at times and for the most part we really steer clear of product launches and uh, tech specs. Um, before we get to the interviews, some thoughts on this year's show. Uh, it was both, it felt both larger and smaller than last year. It felt larger in that there seemed to be an uptick in attendance. I would say probably not back to pre-pandemic levels, but there was a, a, a bit more energy in the air uh, and larger in that uh, a bunch of companies that were unable to attend last year due to COVID restrictions in, and lockdowns in China were able to get to this year's show. And that was a really, uh, a well, their presence was really welcome. And that was, that was exciting. Um, it felt smaller uh, in that a lot of the big companies had downsized the, uh, their, their booths. Um, and this was due to increased vendor costs. One company told me uh, their booth was half the size that it was uh, last year, but they spent the same amount of money. Uh, this doesn't really end up affecting what they show, uh, but it, it, just, it just changes the splashiness of their footprint. Um, there was a clear zeitgeist to last year's show. Last year it was all robot arms and LED walls. And... Uh, Robot arm motion control has been in Hollywood for a really long time now, but last year it seemed like there was this was the moment when a bunch of different companies were trying to convince you that you needed to have a robot arm and it needed to run their software. And then the LED wall displays uh, last year were just massive and it was definitely the statement being this is the technology of the Mandalorian and the Batman, and it is here today. Um, and neither, uh, neither pro a, a technology really had that kind of presence this year, uh, which is not to say that virtual production has taken a step back or is in any way diminished. It has definitely grown, and it's gotten larger by getting smaller, uh, That's which is to say, uh, a lot of products now have been targeted at smaller and mid-sized uh, uh, studios with solutions that are more appropriate to the size of what they might be working on. And some of it's gotten all the way down to where they've stripped out the LED wall component entirely, but they're keeping the tracking, the real-time tracking component and the real-time virtual environment component that comes from usually Unreal Engine. Uh, and then they're combining that with cheap uh, green screen and putting it in a package that runs completely, entirely on an iPad. I mean, an iPad. And that's kind of bananas. Uh, I think the takeaway there is that there's never been a better time to be a 12-year-old who's interested in becoming a filmmaker. Uh, it's really exciting if that's where you are. Uh, I think it's, it's incredibly dizzying and daunting if you are uh, a director of technology in a small studio trying to make uh, purchases and investments that will pay for themselves before they become completely obsolete because it really does seem like the case that today's Hollywood blockbuster bleeding edge tech, bleeding edge technology 
uh, is tomorrow's iPhone app. Uh, and in the end, that's really good for all of us, but it's moving very, very quickly. In fact, I think uh, it won't be very long before we lose the green screen entirely and we just use AI to rotoscope out any background you happen to film in front of. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but it's like, give it 10 minutes. And I think next year, the zeitgeist is definitely going to be AI everything, but AI is something that is moving so quickly that it's impossible to read the tea leaves out that far, so I won't even speculate on what that's gonna look like. So robot arms and LED walls on one side, uh, AI on the other, this year ended up feeling kind of like a pause, a, a more conventional show, uh, and we're just sort of in an in-between moment. Uh, there were some new cameras, but nothing as splashy as the Alexa 35, which last year, even if you were never going to be able to use one yourself, you definitely wanted to sort of rub up against it for good luck. Um, there were new lenses, a lot of new lenses, uh, which is par for the course every year. Uh, though this year, it seems like everyone's got an anamorphic. That space has, the budget anamorphic space has just exploded. And it's hard to remember that the category didn't even exist a few years ago. Um, that's exciting and we get a lot more choice. It's also the case that as filmmakers, we always get more excited about lenses than, well, way out of proportion to the probability that we'll actually use them in production. Uh, I think we sort of think of them as Pokemon, like you gotta catch them all. Um, but um, it also felt like everyone's kind of doing everything now. Like Small Rig has uh, lights and a follow focus and a tripod that they didn't have, none of, the, of which they had last year. Hollyland has a camera. Hollyland has a camera. Um, Nisi has uh, their own line of lenses that lean into uh, taking their filters really easily. Uh, and that all sorts of get, gets confusing. I'm not sure how I feel about this. Uh, sometimes I just want to think you should focus on your core competencies and really deliver a best in breed product. Uh, at the same time, if you're able to bring something new to the table, definitely, it's definitely cool if you crash the party. That is, that is how we got the original Blackmagic pocket cinema camera and that revolutionized an entire segment of indie digital filmmaking, uh, not just with innovations that they introduced, but validating the space and then see, and uh, pro, you know, causing innovation from a lot of other companies. So that's a good thing. Uh, but sometimes it does feel like at times some products are just a land grab where someone has recognized a proven market space where it seems they can introduce a cheap knockoff and it's low hanging fruit. I'm less keen on that. So it's a case by case basis. Um, YouTubers, if you subscribe to uh, the uh, filmmaking uh, content creators, uh, the show floor basically looks like your YouTube subscription page. Everyone is here and that's fun. Uh, a, there are, a, some of them get, sometimes there, there'll be people running around uh, that treat the YouTubers like rock stars and recognize them. And then there's a whole crowd of filmmakers who aren't on YouTube at all and they're just very confused. Um, Kofi made a really interesting observation uh, because all of the YouTubers sort of filmed themselves with the camera right in front of them. Uh, you basically think that all, all YouTubers are your height. Uh, so it's really surprising when you see them in person because most of them are not. Uh, and that's fun. Um, back to that Hollyland light. Uh, it's actually kind of intriguing. I didn't really spend as much time with it as I probably should have. Uh, it's a box camera. I, I said light, a camera. It's a box camera, but it's not a cinema camera. You can't really rig it up, and there's, I don't think there was ever any intention for you to do that. Um, but it's really designed to fit a niche of 
streaming. It supports live streaming really well, and it has design considerations for vertical video. So it's a niche product uh, for a niche segment that I think might love it, and outside of that, uh, it will be overlooked or scoffed at. Um, at the same time, I think it might be wildly overpriced. And it might be the case that their nearest competitors are not cameras, other cameras, that their nearest competition is phones. And I don't know about the wisdom of trying to compete in a space that is dominated by phones. At the same time, I can see a situation where you might have an A camera and a B camera and a C overhead C camera. And if they built it so that you could uh, switch between them while you streamed li the live feed, uh, that could be a compelling uh, use case scenario. Uh, but So I'm interested to see where that goes, but I'm also very skeptical. Soonwell has a light that also was interesting to me. I didn't get any footage of it, but um, you know, we've gone from six, you know, 300s to 600s and 1200s. This is their 2000, uh, which they say is the equivalent of a 2.5K HMI, which is a lot of light. That's a powerful light. I have no idea if it's any good, but uh, they did something that did get me really excited. The head is very small and compact at the top of a C-stand, uh, which we've come to expect. You then run a cable to a ballast, um, and traditionally what we've come to expect is the ballast would be oriented in terms of Apple Box technology, ter terminology, you would say it would be oriented New York style, very tall, and designed to hang on a knob on your C-stand. Uh, Soonwell's design is oriented in the flat LA configuration, and it's massive. It's like bigger than a bread box, and it is clearly designed to sit flat on the floor, which also means you can't knock it over. Uh, it is still small enough to sit inside the footprint of a C-stand, um, but what's cool about it is when you go to pick it up, uh, it is shockingly light. I, I went to yank it up expecting it to be really heavy and it just, I, I was very surprised and immediately delighted because it was clear they'd taken a different choice uh, in terms of the design where they were going to uh, trade off increased volume for reduced weight, significantly reduced weight. And this is the thing, as we get more powerful products and try to put them into smaller form factors, uh, they generate a ton of heat so that most of the bulk and the weight in some of these products goes to heat management and dissipation. And this isn't just lights, uh, cameras too. Uh, the Alexa 35 is bigger than the Mini because it's more powerful and it needs a bigger fan and it needs a bigger heat sink. Um, all of these compact cameras with dual card slots, we always complain that one of those slots is an SD card, but if you put twin CFast ex uh, CF Express cards in there, it's really hard to keep it from catching fire. Um, so Soonwell's solution is to create a lot of empty space and be able to move a lot of air through a smaller heat sink with a smaller fan and I'm excited to see if uh, the light is any good. I can't speak to that. You really have to get in, into a studio or out in the field and test it, but the design choice around their ballast uh, got me excited. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, please enjoy these interviews. I think you'll find some really interesting things in them. If you have any follow-up questions that you'd like me to ask um, let me know in the comments, and if you have any uh, other people that you'd be interested in seeing interviewed in this style, please let me know in the comments, and I will try to do that at Cinegear, which is surprisingly just around the corner. So Dan, thank you so much for uh, chatting with us. We're here at the Atlas booth, which is one of my favorite booths, it's and I know see you, Jess. Thank you so it's much. great to see you, you too. So we talked at an SOC event uh, in LA, and I asked you a question that I, I prefaced with, I'm not sure you'll want to answer this. And then you gave me just the best answer. And I'm like, I want to get that on film. And I said, if you could start with the Mercuries, would you ever build the Orions? And do the Mercuries make the Orions obsolete? So do you remember what you told me? I will paraphrase if I can. I don't remember exactly what I said, but 
uh, I think what I said was we wouldn't have been able to build the Mercury lenses if we hadn't built the Orion lenses because everything that we do is a process of learning. And so yeah. it would have been impossible to jump right to building the Mercury lens if we hadn't built the Orions. Um, not only from a financial standpoint, but also from a uh, learning and development standpoint. So the secret of Atlas Lensco is our philosophy, uh, the philosophy that drives what we do in terms of our product roadmap, our thinking, our interaction, the way that we work as a team, the way that we work with the world outside. We care about cinematography, we care about users because we are users, we're filmmakers, uh, cinematographer uh, for over 20 years now. And I've just been fortunate enough to learn from the best, but what I try to do is apply life learning to what we do in terms of building the lenses. And so the Orions, we're within grasp of something we imagine. We built prototypes, we built three prototypes first, small 65 yeah. millimeter focal length, and then showed them to people and said, is this something you actually like? Because um, we, I like them, Boris liked them. We didn't know if the world at large would like the lenses, but I really wanted a set of anamorphic lenses that embodied everything that we managed to do with the Orion. Right. And um, everything that we did with the Orions taught us how to make a different lens which is what became Mercury. Right. Um, and, and I will say, I think now it's easy to, to, to forget about where you, from where you started. This is an, was an unproven space. I was talking to Trito uh, the other day about all of these other anamorphics coming from some of these companies. And one, he, yeah. yeah, and he said something really interesting. He was like, yeah, I was really impressed with the, these lenses. Uh, they'll get a piece of the pie. And, my, and I was like, and it's a growing pie and it's a pie, I, I kind of feel like it's a pie that Atlas baked, and it, it didn't exist five, like when you got into the space, there was no absolute reason to be super confident that this was something that the market, there would be a huge market for, but it turns out there's a market enough that other people have jumped in. I think that's pretty cool. And you're also I, maybe the only booth that's actually grown in size from last year to this year, a lot of, because the, the, the costs of the booths have gotten more expensive, a lot of people have downsized, including some of these really big companies. So congratulations on that success. Thank you. Um, going back to the philosophy, yeah. one of the things, uh, you know, in that space, especially, well, with lenses in general, but especially with anamorphics, uh, the choice of how you you give it character matters a lot. You know, Ari chooses to go with a very clean, neutral look, and you're never gonna get fired for choosing an Ari Master Prime, but you're never gonna get, and I don't mean to say I would, I love the Ari look, but you're never gonna get, get an article about the genius of you choosing an Ari Master Prime either. You know, it's just, you're starting from like this perfect clean image. You guys get to choose, and I think this is one of the most exciting things about, um, the lens space itself is when you choose character for your lens, you're also in a way choosing character and feels for whole movies. You said you were really influenced, um, uh, well, for some things by like the look of, um, of Punch Drunk Love. Uh, what is that like in terms of when you're in the shop and, this, and, and making those kinds of decisions and, and, and t well, tell me more about the well, thinking great. and... This is a great question in general, like for Atlas, the key driving question is why, right? Always start with why. So why do we like anamorphic lenses? We like anamorphic lenses because a lot of the films that we watched growing up were filmed on anamorphic lenses. But why were those, len why were those movies filmed with those lenses? And for me, uh, Punch Drunk Love, Photographed by Robert Ellswood, ASC, directed by Respect. Thomas Anderson, starring Thomas, or starring Adam Sandler. Um, for me, that was an awakening film where I'm watching it and I go, "Why does this movie look this way?" So it's the beginning. Of going back to why. Right. Right. So we're watching this movie, and when the lens is a character in this movie, it's part of the storytelling. But why? So I dug down the rabbit hole and found out, okay, they use Panavision C-Series lenses. And then many of my favorite films growing up were filmed with Panavision right. C-Series or B-Series auto Panatars. But why were those lenses made? Why do these exist at all? So I went down that rabbit hole. And really, if you want to dig down to the bottom of it, there's three spheres of influence. There's commerce, business, 
uh, technology, our, our art form is an inherently technical art form. It requires technology. Even if we were telling stories in a cave, fire is the technology, right? So yeah. we're, we're casting shadows on the wall and telling stories with shadows. Did Play you know? Cave, that's technology. This is a and deep tour. Art, that's the human, uh, the human implementation, right? So what, yeah. we, what we create as creative storytellers or what we pass is human knowledge from one human or a generation of humans to another yeah. uh, is a huge part of that storytelling. So uh, go ahead. You oh, say. You, may, you said uh, about cave paintings. This is a total detour and I don't even care. Um, it's my channel. Um, yeah, I'm going to do what I want. These um, uh, cave, they found, someone figured out that a lot of the cave paintings where you see animals with like double heads and people that are sort of doubled, it's because when, when you were in that cave, those are animations, they're not still photos, because the wow. flickering of the firelight would give you this, you know, they, they're, the because reason those have, would cast yeah, shadows. and they'd have the doubling, isn't mind that cool? Mind blown, mind blown. Ooh. I've had a lot of mind blowing uh, discussions and experiences at this show, actually, believe it or not. Like, that's the best thing about being back right. in the show, connecting with people in the community that I don't get to see every day or every week, but we gather here for this kind of event. It's a big human event, but uh, I was reminded, speaking with Roy Wagner, ASC yesterday, he told me, uh, filmmaking is dangerous. Why? Because, well, it's like making a product. I make products like I make films. We start with an idea, and that's your script, right? That's your outline. But you get to set and you start the process and then things change. And if you're not able to change and adapt on a film set, you'll never get the film made. And the same is true of making a product. You start with a roadmap and a, a blueprint of what you want to do and you learn along the way and that's that's the process of developing. So every take is a prototype for the perfect take on a film. And every step in the product making process is a step towards the better product. Um, and you know, that's kind of like human evolution or like evolution of our thought process. Right. Um, but coming back to uh, what Mr. Wagner said, he said, it's a risk, you're taking a risk, right? So in the days of film, you'd only have at most nine minutes on a magazine of film. Right. right. So you wouldn't have people coming in and changing hair and makeup during a take while the camera's rolling because once you run that film mag out, you're out. And sometimes, depending on the director, depending on the budget, again, coming back to the commerce technology, energy, yeah. right? Commerce, we're going to run out of film. We're not going to be able to make our day. So they were more prudent with the choices that they made. And sometimes the director wouldn't do more than one take. So you'd have to, as an actor, you'd have to show up and give your best performance on the first performance. Right. Uh, as a lighting person, you'd have to make sure that it's lit the way the DP needs it. And as a sound person, yeah. you want to make sure the boom's in the right place. I mean, I think if anybody saw Babylon, the whole scene where they introduce sound and they're trying to get the sound right, yeah, that says it all, right? I, I don't know if that movie was for anyone other than filmmakers. But I it was very film, much for filmmakers. But it, it was really, yeah, it's for filmmakers. Yeah, for yeah. Um, but it's just sort of, it reminded me, yes, there's a huge amount of risk in what we do, but if you show up, you're bound to be rewarded one way or another. And so that's been kind of a, a, a reminder of just how fragile and precious life is and how fragile and precious our opportunities are. So take a risk is what I'd encourage people to do. Um, don't take a blind risk, although sometimes I do. Um, <laughs> well, they've been working out. Don't, don't be too calculated. Use your yeah. instinct. You know, that's a yeah. very human thing. Use your instinct. Listen to your heart, but also look with your eyes, look and listen around. He, he mentioned that Ansel Adams, who is his teacher in photography, said, okay, take one photo, right? Okay, you get to take one photo. Now, put your camera down. Now, without picking up the camera, look around you and observe a hundred different compositions. Yeah. And you're looking around. I mean, that's how I, that's how I became a DP is I grew up yeah. looking at light coming in through the window of the house. Oh, I, I used to, really interesting. I used to shoot a Pentax 67, and it's just a giant brick. And, you, and if you're shooting 220, you've got 20. 20 shots max, I'm, you gotta and in 120 you've got 12, and then you've got to reload, and yeah, it teach it taught me so much about how to think through, and yeah, that that's that's something we're definitely spoiled today. But now I do want to get back to how, th this is the ethos that pervades Atlas, and it really and and the fact that that ends up showing up 
in the lenses. And I would say, you know, one of the things I think is most exciting here is while we have all this incredible digital technology democratizing filmmaking, you've come from another direction, leaned into that, and then provided a catalyst for a whole other way of making a look and making making films so that they will so that they have character um, do you want to talk a, a bit about the character in Absolutely. the uh, so, and the character choices in the mercuries I mean every lens design is a compromise so um, just like every film is a series of compromises but every lens design is a compromise there's no such right. thing as a perfect lens uh, but what we try to do is embrace the kind of perfections that we like or that have inspired us along the way and there's different levels of imperfection different qualities that exist between a mercury series and an orion series lens and we lean into uh, if anybody what i like to say is if you hated orion series lenses <laughs> You might love a Mercury series lens. If you loved an Orion series lens, you may also love a Mercury series <laughs> lens. So we didn't do 180 degrees opposite. We took all the really good qualities that we developed in the Orion and nuanced things in a slightly different direction. So it's polarizing, um, but these have a lot of barrel distortion for a 1.5 times anamorphic lens. But we wanted to embrace that barrel distortion is part of the architecture. So these have a patent-pending optical architecture that is unlike any other anamorphic lens. So in a way, this is maybe one of the most exciting design things that's happening in anamorphic lenses in the last 70 years. Uh, so that's a big deal to me and to the team. Uh, huge shout out Scott DeWald, huge shout out Forrest Schultz, my co-founder. Uh, between them, you know, I, I, I set a bar of challenge for them to try to accomplish something really crazy. And they didn't just meet the bar, they exceeded the bar by reaching even further. Yeah. But what we try to do with these is have very low chromatic aberration, high level of barrel distortion, uh, minimal breathing, but a unique breathing style that's empowered by the architecture that we've designed. And there are some really clever choices that allowed us to get these as small as they are, and uh, they fit PL mount, so they're made to go on film cameras or digital cameras. And the 1.5 squeeze is made for traditionally more modern film sensor aspects of a 16 by nine sensor, but it also looks great on four by three film or even on uh, 185 uh, three per film. So you get a variety of aspect ratios you can deliver by having 1.5 yeah. times anamorphic. And instead of trying to make the perfect lens, we're trying to make the perfectly imperfect lens. Uh, so right. they have really good close focus, which is something I need and want as a camera person when I'm filming. They have golden uh, amber street flares instead of the blue flares, which you traditionally see with like a Panavision C series. I like uh, the warmth like, of these. I like them both, honestly, because like Punch Drunk Love is all blue flares. Yeah, it is. The magnesium fluoride coatings on those Panavision C series. And there's a ton of barrel distortion in that. I love that movie. <laughs> and so this is like an alternate reality version of that lens. Um, and you know, it's, it's crazy because if the world was the way that it is now with a level of accessible lens options, and I hadn't started this company, I don't know if I would have started the company. So right. if seven years ago, this many options were in the marketplace, I, if we are, if this company existed outside of me, I wouldn't have started a lens company because I wouldn't have said, oh, that, I'm going to that, that being said, I think it is definitely the case that a lot of those options are an outgrowth of people recognizing the demand from what Atlas established and set in the marketplace. So it, it, there's no, there's no, th that egg doesn't exist without this chicken first, right? That's a, that's a great point, exactly. You know. Yes, it's a, it's a chicken and egg uh, paradigm for sure. But uh, if anybody out there saw our uh, April 1st product launch, oh my God. the Atlas Serious <laughs> series lenses, then you know we're dabbling with experimenting with all kinds of silly things. We actually built those lenses. They're here. Uh, I could grab one out of the case and show you. We could put it on the camera. But as we like to say, it's for your artisanal aspect ratio needs. It's the first one by anamorphic lens. So, you know, we took it, a Orion series lens set and then took all the anamorphic elements out and then recalibrated the lenses so that they would actually focus and function. Uh, how much, so that was maybe my favorite April Fool's joke this year, but how much work was that to, because you put a ton into the, the launch video too. Well, that's a huge, 
do a huge part to uh, Rick Darge and to our team. <laughs> so first of all, we started by saying uh, about a, a month before April Fool's Day, we said, well, you know, what would happen if we took the anamorphic elements out of an Orion series? So we have a <laughs> tremendous team of uh, technicians that build the lenses in Glendale. So, well, you know, we're going to have you undo some of your work here and take some of the anamorphic elements out of the lenses you've already built and calibrated. And that took us about a week to, uh -huh. to take a set and get them calibrated without the anamorphic group in. And uh, people are looking at me like, why are we doing this? Like, you, you're <laughs> crazy. But they're also willing to take a risk, right? So, like, well, you know, in a way, if we're taking a film set paradigm, you're the director, so we're going to listen <laughs> to what you say even if we think you're crazy, which they did. They all did. Um, but we made cool lenses. They look kind of like a vintage Baltar, or some of them look a little bit. I don't want to compare them to the Rule 35. That's, but other people told me, hey, they look kind of like a K35. I don't know if I see it, but you you all be the judge. You let me know. But I, I, I think this also, this is a funny story, but it also actually speaks to the fact that you've got your engineering in-house and you have a really direct connection to them it, it, it or not even like it's another department but you are interfacing with them constantly yeah, at, a, at a deep level we're a very tight and, and we did not plan this part of the conversation i just realized that it's talking okay. to you now we have such a tight-knit uh group it's kind of like a family or it's more like a band so you know sometimes you jam and sometimes you you play the songs you know right so when you're lucky you get in a jam session and you're like okay let's Let's figure this out. Let's try some things that we haven't tried before. And that can lead to interesting places. Or it could just be a total noodle fest and you don't get anywhere. But that's part of the process <laughs> as creatives and yeah. technicians and engineers. So um, just really grateful for our team. And then super huge thanks to Rick Darge and Vinny Balbo uh, and our team who are all in the, the Serious Series launch film. But Rick Darge put that together in about a week worth of time. Mm -hmm. Uh, huge thanks to Rodney Charters, huge thanks to Clementine, everyone who is in the, the launch film, really grateful to you, and uh, thanks for having fun with us, it was, it's, it was a pleasure, yeah. and um, I think the point you're trying to get back to is, um, it's nice to have a team that works so tight-knit, yeah. right? that's true. Yeah. Um, and is there anything you want to tease before we let you go? Well, I have a question. I have, I have two questions, actually, yeah. before we go. Oh, okay. So, uh, question one, are you Team Boca or Team Bokeh? Team Bokeh. Team Bokeh. Okay. Okay, Bokeh. I am. Uh, I, I'll be honest, I waffle, so... Uh, I, I was Team... Actually, it depends on what day, if I've had enough sleep, <laughs> how much coffee I've had, or if I had a few drinks the night before. I, I think so I, I was with it, you know? because I think it, it comes from is it the Korean or the Japanese it's Japanese, a Japanese word yeah, uh, yeah. so and, and we didn't really use it un, until fairly recently linguistically in this industry so I I would I feel like we can respect uh, the the origins I can be a bit of a of a, a, a grammar snob sometimes I like that it's a very divisive. Uh, topic, which is why I brought it up, because I, I love to hear people. So, but then you said you waffle. If I if I have to to, to pin you down on it, Team Boca or Team Bokeh? Well, I like to be fancy, so I sometimes. Sometimes <laughs> I'm a little rough. Sometimes I'm a little fancy. It's kind of funny, like the Michelin star restaurant. I find myself yeah. saying Boca more times than Bokeh, but okay. I like saying Bokeh. So I push myself to say bouquet. You're like, but I don't want to say like bouquet or bouquet. Right. It's bouquet. bouquet. You're, you're like bouquet. the guy who's like, oh yeah, I go to Michelin starred restaurants, but I get Michelin tires, even though it's the same company that there makes the guide. And I think the O is probably the hidden part of the word, like the the bo 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 bo. Like you can have a long O or a short O. I think that's the mid the missing part in English. Uh, language like you have like a bow or a bow, bow, bow okay, bow okay. This bow is okay, just, the, okay. to the to the audience out there. This is the secret uh, at NAB is if the if the interview goes long enough, we just go off the rails into all new territory. Uh, Dan, thank one you. More question, oh yes. Actually. I'm sorry, my bad. No, it's um, it's our channel. We can do it now. So unedited. If I was to offer you a free Orion on the show floor right now, what would you say? I know where this is going, but offer him, offer him one. Michael, can I offer Look you at his one? eyes! Can I be a free Orion on the show right now? He's okay. got very big eyes right now. Oh, <laughs> Orion, for you. For you. Cheers. <laughs>
One for you, Jazz. <clears throat> Cheers. Oh, oh, Ryan. Oh, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> for your happy time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Really Always appreciate it. Um, if you're in Glendale, California, or anywhere in the Los Angeles area on a Wednesday, stop by for Wednesday, Wednesday at Atlas Lens Co. We're at 6933 San Fernando Road. Every Tuesday, we do an interactive live stream where we will show you the lenses you want to see through the professional camera you want to see, whether it's a mirrorless camera. We don't have an HD tap for a 435, so I can't show you that yet. But we'll show you any modern cinema camera with an HD tap and uh, any mirrorless camera you want to see with any lens. Uh, and interact with you, answer your questions through the live stream on Instagram Live and YouTube Live simultaneously. So, huge shout out. Thanks for coming by. Uh, stay well and have a great week. Thank you so much. I really Cheers, appreciate man. it. So we're at the Ari booth, which is always super exciting. They bring a band and magicians, but in between the, 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 mm -hmm. the sound that's hard to interview with. And <laughs> we're going to fit us in. Yeah. I'm gonna get, I get to interview Chase, and we're going to talk about, I'm going to ask him the, the, your burning question, which is, why are Ari products so damn expensive? <laughs> that's a good question. First, I could say that Ari products in general I, I kind of exude quality. Everything is made in Germany. Everything is made for the highest quality materials, but it's really more than that. What I like to define is there's a difference between cost and price. And this is something that a lot of people don't think of when you say, well, is it the price that bothers you or is it the cost that bothers you? Because they're actually very different things. You don't think of it that way. So yes, the Aerie cameras might be priced higher than others. Aerie lighting might be priced higher than others. But price and cost are very different, right? Because if I buy another product, perhaps that maybe is priced lower, and I go around and I shoot my project and I have a lot of issues on set where I'm wasting time and sometimes the camera's not reliable because I'm in an extreme environment and then I'm shooting and I realize, ah, oh, I gotta add more lights because it's not very good at low light and now I spent some time and effort and more equipment to do that. Then I get back and uh, you know I look at my footage and maybe I have some issues where I'm trying to color grade something and lift stuff up and it's not looking good and I have to go back and reshoot it or maybe some of my high speed isn't the same quality as my regular speed so it's not using in the final edit and then I got to go reshoot that so all of that you know you spending sound, hours you sound like you're speaking from experience yes I've had customers literally call me and go yeah I'm tired of spending hours grading footage from another camera to make it look great because that's time that's money that's effort all of that and so that ends up making everything cost more right in the long run it's more trouble it's more pain it's more suffering and it's more money so the cost of another product might end up being higher because of the fact that you have to do all of that. So Aerie cameras, they might be priced higher, and Aerie products might be priced higher, but it ends up costing you less in the long run because they're more reliable. They give you great images out of the box. They're more flexible. You don't have to worry about so much. And cost ends up, there's, there's a cost in time and a cost in pain as well. Correct, and emotional and suffering and uh, physical suffering sometimes Now too. something I, and, and this was the thing that made it really click for me in understanding mm -hmm. the why an, like an RA thing you see and you see it on set and why people are just like comfortable and happy mm -hmm. a steady cam operator once looked at me and so it's like you know and he was talking and, mm. and especially with the history of gimbals and when they first came out and were mm -hmm. kind of unreliable and there, there were some really cool cameras with really cool features but if you didn't black shade them every between yeah. every take you know yeah, they, I might have some issues in image then, quality then in post but he, you have to reshoot but he said okay imagine there's a you, you're, you're paying two actors $15 million a piece. You're gonna blow up a car, there's pyro, and you've got a 100 person crew. Yeah, waiting. It's a $700,000 day. He said, mm -hmm. I can cost that production 10 times my day rate in 15 minutes. Absolutely, do that math. I mean, like, that 50, is it 700,000 divided by 12 hours, $75,000 an hour? 15 minutes, that's, you know, yeah. $20,000. And he, he was like, if the focus puller has a high five or Preston, mm. but if he, you know, he did, the the production doesn't care if he why that that he didn't spend that money versus like a nano. Yes, you know, yeah. and everybody's got an all the focus pullers have a nano in their back pocket as a backup just in case. Sure, because they don't want to spend ten grand on on mm. their backup. Yeah, but, yeah, true. But they're absolutely in a professional environment. 
you have to you have to make that right investment. right when i turn that knob the motor has to do that right. and i have to know that it can do that because my key actor whether it's a you know tom cruise or someone like that is not going to be wanting to sit there going okay am i waiting for you guys to get this going i'm going to go wait in my trailer right because it's like oh hold for focus i mean that's one thing that a camera assistant will tell you i never want to be noticed on set camera assistant is you know silent gets their job done and the only time you notice a camera assistant is when something's going wrong or something's out of focus so yeah. anything that draws attention to a camera assistant, they're like terrified. They're hiding, you know, kind of thing. My dad um, mm -hmm. worked for the CIA, and he he said uh, their entire ethos is if we're in the news, it's a really bad day. And that's that's a camera assistant. A camera Literally, assistant. same philosophy. So having a reliable tool like a high five is very important. So, so. the other thing I want to talk about sure. is, you know, it, the way I would put it is, are, there are certain companies that. You can get a new camera from them every seven months. Yep. And like there's a, a lot of YouTube videos telling you why you need it. Yeah. Um, you don't do that. It's more mm -hmm. like every once in a while, you drop a camera and like, you're going to love this for the next 15 years. Definitely. We are actually shooting uh, our, our tights on an XST, which mm -hmm. when did that come out? SXT started shipping 2016. Yep. 2016. And my camera guy bought it right before the show at an auction. <laughs> Oh, nice. So that he could shoot on yeah. uh, a, a, a format that it, that the, that his mini doesn't do. Sure, sure, sure. And sure. he's ex super excited about yeah, it. Yeah, and it's the same fantastic image quality. I mean, it's the same sensor design we're featuring even on our cameras right here, like the Amira Live. So, so mm -hmm. let's talk about that philosophy and what sure. drives that, and and why on a professional set with a lot of people that consistency matters, mm -hmm. and why. The, that urge for the next big thing and the next resolution, et cetera, is right. It, you don't really feel that as much in when you're making really big movies that, that we all right. love to watch on IMAX. It's all about having, you know, of course, the, the philosophy behind it is not about specs, it's not about numbers. Um, our competitors feel that numbers and specs often are what sells a camera, and we've always gone back to the best overall image quality. It's been the same, maybe we might boring, if you will, catch line from day one, which is best overall image quality. It's not numbers, it's hard to quantify, but you see it in the pictures. I always say, it's the proof is in the pictures. And so when we came out with Alexa, proof was in the pictures and people said they wanted things like, oh, I want built-in raw, I want more things in the camera. So we added it, we had an XT and then we have an SXT, we have the mini, because people wanted the same airy image quality in a small camera. Or they have an Amira because they wanted to do a documentary with the same airy image quality. There was always a reason behind that camera. It wasn't just like, oh, let's slap this all together and hey, look, here's a new camera. It was because, hey, I want to go make a documentary and I need built-in audio recording. Okay, we've got the Amira. Hey, it needs to fit in a gimbal, I need it really small, but I want the airy image quality. Okay, we've got the mini. So everything evolves based on customer feedback. Same with the large format, right? We had the Alexa LF, and that only exists because the Alexa 65 was so popular. We built the Alexa 65 with our friends at Airy Rental. They showed it as a product, and it was renting like crazy. And we thought, well, if everyone likes an Alexa 65, then we want to evolve and, and do have a camera that you can buy with a large format. So everything is based on customer feedback. And yes, we don't change things. We haven't changed our color science or log curve, um, technical things like that, unless necessary. And now we did with the Alexa 35 because it has so much dynamic range, but it's not just for the sake of changing things. It's always a reason. It's always about raising the bar, and actually, that's the catch line for so the Alexa 35. Is, I'm hearing that, and in, I think in many ways, the technology that you're developing is following the, the demand yeah. of the customer rather than yeah. the... I don't want to say another ca camera company name, but someone who yeah. comes out with cameras every six months trying to generate demand. Yes, because nobody the, liked the old the one, technology. didn't sell, so yeah, right. now we have a or, new one. Or it's perfectly good, but we've already sold it to you. Really, yeah, so now we want another case. one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and, and th this is an interesting thing too, is uh, the roots in film, another place I've noticed it shows mm. up, is in something like the Maxima head for the Trinity. Yeah. If you look at um, other gimbals, uh, that have been now, now we're using them for handheld and yeah. uh, you can, the, the, the fact that they came from drones is really obvious in the order in which they solve the axes. They do uh, tilt, then roll, then pan, yep. and the Maxima head does roll, then tilt, mm -hmm. then pan, uh, roll, roll, tilt, pan rather than tilt, roll, pan. And, and it's the, not two right angle plates. That's, and the, the, that's the difference the is you get put the optical center of the lens Correct. straight down the roll axis. And yep. it's so obvious that this was developed by filmmakers because when you're doing steady, what do you care about most? A level horizon. horizon. Yep. And it makes sense with drones that you would solve tilt first because yeah. when you're flying, you what, do you, what 
do you need to most often correct mm -hmm. for? Mm -hmm. And it's that the tilt. Totally. But just just that small difference on the consume on the prosumer handheld gimbals, mm -hmm. it means there's no three lines that intersect as a center of gravity. Definitely. So balancing it is just radically harder. Yep. And they're really good now at being like, well, we'll solve it all with math and powerful motors. Yes. Because we can, Software but it's less tuning. elegant Definitely. than than like, oh yeah, the optical center of the lens. And being able to put the whole camera through, right? Because right. if you have two yeah. offsetting right plates, you can never build a very long camera because you're always hitting the back of the offsetting yeah. plates. It's not that ring design. I mean, when everyone saw the ring, it was like, wow, I would have right. thought this before is to have everything go through a ring. But that, that, that it is, ends up being the natural solution when you're coming from film. Yeah. Now, I have been dying to <laughs> actually show audiences this, my favorite part of the Alexa 35, and it's so silly, but as a machinist, my favorite part of the Alexa 35 since it came out last year, which is this top handle, this removable top handle. No tools. No tools. Yeah. Uh, so there's something we call, in, in, in you know, machinists will talk about some, something being Let's, finger tight. Oh, what's it hitting? Hitting anything? No? Yeah, no, it comes there right you out. Go. There's finger tight, monkey tight, and gorilla tight. Ah. And, it, and you guys are German engineering, so you do guten tight. Okay. Good and tight, I love um, it. But what's really cool about this top handle, it is my one of my favorite designs ever. I don't know if, can you mm -hmm. get this uh, angle? Mm -hmm. This uses this wedge right here that interfaces with a matching wedge mm -hmm. on the other side. And then you look at these front, part, these front nubs, they fit into sockets, right? Now, a screw, when you screw it down, a screw is just a wedge wrapped around a cone or a cylinder. And then let's seat this here. I'm to do it in the double hand. There we go. When you start screwing a screw down, you use torque, rotational force, and as you get closer down, you're generating a lot of friction all across that wedge. And when people are really trying to crank down on it, they're trying to really build that friction up. But that will always come loose under vibration over mm. time. This, when you push the wedges together, the the screw brings these wedge mm -hmm. plates together, and we use this in, in on mm -hmm. like mills, on okay. vices. Ah. We, you can get a, with a little bit of torque, you right. can get a, an insane amount of, of pressure, pressure. Yeah. on the vice with, that is way outsized to the amount of torque you're putting on yeah, it. Yeah. In the reverse, when you push that wedge up as you screw down, it puts shear against, uh, mm. against the screw, and it locks in so well. Yeah. I designed to take it. 100 pounds. Yeah. When we, you, sh it, you can go to finger tight and then start turning it back um, about 170 degrees before there's any perceivable play, play. at all. Wow. And that's finger tight. Yeah. This, <laughs> I get chills yeah. just thinking <laughs> about the genius of this design and the fact that we're seeing it in something like a top uh, handle. Right. And that seems to, you know, pervades so many of the design elements in and the consideration around the, the crafting of everything that I've seen around Ari that is just it's it's really kind of thrilling I can't afford this but I can ad, but admiring it from a, and admiring it from afar is fun but ad, admiring it up close is amazing and it's, I I don't think people really no. realize out there this top handle should just whoever did it earned their salary that day <laughs> for, the year, for the year for the year it's amazing That's and awesome. yes i'm clearly fanboying but it's the 4 a.m thinking i like to call it at airy so right. when, you know as we get on and on everyone is asked to work faster longer hours um you know and, and the really big thing is that when i'm working you know let's say at 4 a.m in the rain and I'm worried about, okay, I gotta change these settings on the camera, the menu's gotta be easy, but what about accessories? When it's 4 a.m. and they're yelling at me and we're trying to make our day, we're a couple hours over already, I don't wanna have to think to myself, well, what tool was it? Was it M3, M4, was it a 3 16 What key do I need? Is it a flathead? Is this screw different than that screw? So we're really moving toward a toolless system because we also are doing it over here with this little articulated mounting plate. Same idea, it's got this nub here. You can still insert a tool, but a lot of the screws we're using at the bottom of the camera for base plates, 
they have a flat head, then they have a 3 16 then they have a four millimeter, and then they have a three millimeter all nested, all nested into each other. So it doesn't matter whatever tool you kind of have, you can unlock that screw. A lot of the map box uh, pieces are like that too, where they're finger tight easily without having to use a metric three to tighten it down. So it's that 4 a.m. thinking of just not having to worry about what's going on while it's cold and rainy and you're getting yelled at. And someone puts that thinking into this and then it shows up on set yeah. and saves a production time tons money, and, yeah. and, and, an, and arguably an insane amount of money if you can if you can mm -hmm. ruin someone's mm -hmm. uh, you know cost someone your day rate 10x your day rate in 15 yeah. minutes you can save somebody that same amount of money yep. by not having to do that yep. so we're not waiting for camera don't want to hear that I'm thrilled we could get to talk about these aspects of of what makes Ari special because I think it's yeah. something that we don't really see all that often so thank you, you so much I'm really you're it's, very well yeah, I'm so happy to have had this chance to chat with you Awesome. Thank you. Out? Great ending. Great? Yeah, no, I... Thank you. Awesome. How'd that go? How'd you feel about that? That great. That was great. Thank you. Oh. I, I w I'm, I'm so excited that I got the, like, I have had my wish list of things I've wanted to talk about at this show. That top handle. Yeah. Yeah. I can't find it. I love it. It's... The handle is pretty awesome. It, it's, it's... I remember it was one of... We're very excited to be here at the Aperture booth, one, always one of the more exciting booths at the show. I'm here with Brandon Lee, and uh, rather than talking about tech specs, yeah. I really am interested in talking about the Aperture corporate culture and how that affects everything that we as filmmakers end up uh, getting down the line. Uh, I say this because yeah. last year at the Aperture launch party, when I was looking for the bathroom, the security guard directed me right into Ted's green room. Mm -hmm. And about four minutes before he was going to go on stage. So he's got his notes, note cards, and he doesn't know who I am. But he looks up, he puts his note card down, stands up, walks over to me, and gives me the biggest, warmest hug that I've had in years. And he's like, we're so happy to be here. Thank you for coming. And I was just like, you know, when you, you're in the booth and you start talking to Aperture yeah. employees, that same quality it goes permeates the entire company. And I really do feel like that's a lot of where your success comes from, even though Ted would be way too modest about it. Oh yeah, he'd definitely be too modest about that. I mean, it's really important for us, like all of us, a lot of us started out as filmmakers. So we know the struggles of filmmakers, we know the struggles of being on set, and we know how hard everyone in this industry works. So we also know that everyone in this industry, no matter how many times we may bicker on and off set, at the end of the day, we all love each other and we all are supportive of just growing creatively together. So when we see each other at events like Super Secret Film Dinner, or when we see each other at events like NAB, it's really great to be able to say hi to those faces that we've been just seeing on Zoom, to the faces that we've been seeing like across the way, or you've been just seeing on Instagram. I just, like, we're getting to say hi to Brandon. And I will say, again. that yeah. warmth also gets conveyed to people who are just early enthusiasts as well. Not just the people you know, everyone's always equally warm to someone exactly. who's just sort of coming up with that. You know, and you know the look when someone's like, I don't really know what I'm looking at, yeah. but I'm curious. I've always seen you guys have really, like, let's bring you into the fold. Oh yeah, 100%. Because like I said, we've all been there. Like I was there. I, I, before I started working at Aperture, I was a cinematographer. I was using Aperture products like the MX, the M9, the original 300D Mark I. And then Going forward, I also understand like what it's like to be that person who's like, oh, I can finally get something that's affordable, that's accessible right. to me, that I can actually use on the type of set that I'm working on to elevate my craft. Well, that brings me to my next question, which is, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit better about your approach to road mapping products. A lot of companies, if they have something like Aperture and then they have Amaran, for a lot of companies that would mean this is not a, a, a brand that we're sort of just trying to capture a lower end market, but we really don't want the two to be associated with each other. But I've been on some pretty big sets where both both lights were being used concurrently. The Amaran just happened to be, you know, uh, the right thing for the job, and no one bats an eye. You don't, and you've got them both at the same yeah. booth. So you're not. You, it's not like the just this quiet little thing. Uh, you really respect the. Like that, you came up from the indie roots, and you don't want to leave leave these filmmakers behind. I mean, I'm saying that. You tell me, 
more about how yeah for sure uh, about I mean, that ethos like you're saying the, everything's always all at the same booth and whether even if they're two separate booths right across the way from each other it's we're all going to be showcasing them in full force because amaran users and how that got rebranded is just to indicate to everyone hey aperture has grown up a little bit we've matured and we know how to make some products that are a little bit nicer and more professional now but at the same time we know who we came up with we know that we started with indie filmmakers, we know that we started with content creators, and we know that those people still need tools to be to use on their sets. Because at the end of the day, when Aperture first started, we, it was with the goal of creating tools that people could access more easily. We started during the DSLR revolution, Canon 5Ds were coming out, people were able, finally able to buy a camera to get good quality images that, at a lower price point. So there had to be lights that accompanied that. And that was kind of the whole ethos behind Aperture and Amaran. So coming up, we also want to make sure that no matter how expensive or how professional an Aperture product gets, that there's always some Amaran counterpart that you can use that delivers everything, all the value that you need, uh, whether you're starting out or even if you're an indie professional. I see so many corporate, uh, corporate videographers and filmmakers who still use Amaran products all the time because it's all about finding a product that suits your needs specifically, and that's what Amaran's about. For example, just last year at NAB 2022, we did the LS600C Pro. And that was a huge thing. That was our most advanced light to date. But this year, we wanted to come out with the 150C and 300C because, again, we want to call back to those indie filmmaker roots, call back to those creators, call back to everyone who says, I want the functionality of a 600C Pro, but I can't afford that. And I don't need all the bells and whistles like CRMX, DMX, whatever. I just want a light that suits my needs. I can control with situs. So how far out do you have your roadmap? And is, is, is there a holy grail sort of thing that like, and this is where we feel really like we're meeting all of the demand of what filmmakers need? Is there like a five year plan, a 10 year plan? Or, or how is this done? Is it, or is it more just like we, we're looking at the, the feedback come in and it's like, okay, that thing seems like th this is this is what people want how do you how do you figure out what fits in or what's what's next because you're always you you always got some you always have something new and i know that the the development cycle is not can't be it can only be so short. Yeah. Um, what, what is what is that like for you internally? It's, it's a combination of both things. We got to think pretty far ahead in terms of where we want to be. So when we were a few years ago, we were thinking, okay, in a few years, we want Aperture to represent something that can be used on high-end filmmaking sets, something that is made for the professionals. That's something that we had to decide quite a few years ago. But at the same time, we also had to say, like, okay, Amaran accordingly has to step up with the game mm -hmm. a little bit and not just be it be more than what it was and also provide extra value. At the time, it was just creating high quality light at a value price. And now it's creating the best quality light that you can get that suits the needs of the end user, um, no matter who they are, whether they're an Aperture user, someone who's working on professional film sets with more than 50 people, or there's an Amaran user who's still trying to just get, get by with of on their own or up to groups of like 10 or 20 people on set or the people who are in between because let's face it a lot of us live in between i would consider myself in that category where i'm like i want to use a 1200 pro but i also want to use this p60c because this is actually the right tool for this kind of shot and i don't have any after equivalent so at the end of the day we're thinking pretty far ahead but if you also notice sometimes we come out with a pro version we come out with a mark ii and that's because we also always want to be listening to what our users are saying at the end of the day uh, it's a combination of both of those things that helps direct us. And if something is imperative, the users really need something, that's when we'll come through and say, okay, we need to make a fix or we need to make a second iteration on this to really get everything right. Take, for example, just right behind me here, we have the, the bracket for the F22C and F21C. We came out with the F22C, F21C uh, about a year ago in 2022. And now we have this new bracket for it because a lot of users were having some issues with some of our original designs. And we said, okay, that's not okay. We want to satisfy the needs of our users and make this a lot more robust. So we went in back and redesigned what this bracket looks like and feels like and how it works. And I'm happy to say that it's a lot better. And actually, everyone who has used it and touched it has been super happy. So it's definitely a combination of, I can't only think three or four or five years in the future. I also have to be in the here and now to make sure that I'm listening to everything that everyone needs at the end of the Well, day. Aperture definitely seems like one of the most yeah. responsive companies uh, in, in, in the space. Um, I have one more question that just yeah. occurred to me, and it's like LED technology. We've seen in the last, I could have said five years, or I could have said 10 years, or 15 yeah. years, uh, just the technology, the, the core technology 
evolves so quickly. It, it definitely seems to follow something of a Moore's Law kind of yeah. curve. I'm, I go to Burning Man and I remember when it, if you had LEDs yeah. on anything, that meant you were one of the millionaire camps. And now people will just throw LED lights at you, you know, yeah. like they're can like it's candy. What is that like from a development standpoint and in terms of like, are you, is it challenging in terms of like, okay, well, we're not there yet, or is it exciting that like, well, in a very short time, where the core technology is gonna let us do things that, that we couldn't dream about a year ago. How do you, how do you balance uh, that so when, when it's such a fast moving target? It's a, it's a little bit of both. So you, uh, here you are thinking, okay, in the, you have to think about what you can do with the technology you have at hand right now, because especially for uh, a technology that's gonna satisfy most users that isn't necessarily the most cutting edge, you're like, you have to think, okay, what do I have access to now that I don't have to do years and years of development on in order to get to? or what in years, in a few years from now, will be so commonplace that I can't use it for an AMRAM product at the end of the day, like the TIR lenses that I use on the P60C and on the P60X. Thinking ahead to that, it's like this technology is going to be pretty prolific in a few years, just waiting for that time mm -hmm. to work on that type of product. Yeah. But at the same time, also trying to advance as fast and as can. And there must be some challenge if oh, there's yeah. like, oh, but if we use this, this particular thing that's available now, this will be obsolete way too soon. Yeah. Uh, so there's a, a lot of balancing there, right? Exactly. You have to think really far ahead in terms of what technology is, but it's also super exciting because there will be some days where, where we're talking with the engineers and we'll say, hey, is this a solution that we can do, have? And they say, oh, not, maybe not right now. But sometimes a few months, sometimes a year, and sometimes just a few weeks later, we'll have them come back and say, actually, we figured out a solution. Actually, there is a new solution on the market. Or actually, we have developed something. So you're something. planting seeds with your engineers as to like yeah. what you want. And that's, and that's why technology has to always keep on growing behind the scenes, even beyond the product. Your technology has to constantly be developed to see what is accessible to you when it comes time to put that tech inside a product, whether it's the actual core LED technology, the things that you use to control the LEDs, or even things like Citus Link, which is just like an app, but because it uses mesh technology and there's a lot of behind the scenes work that has to do in connection with the hardware, that also has to be thought ahead. And sometimes the program- I was actually to trying like to avoid talking about Citus Link because I could deep dive and get really geeky about yeah. that. I'm like, that interview will get too long. It's, it's pretty amazing, mm -hmm. I mean, especially with in terms of being able to play well with yeah. others. That, uh, on sets, I've had that direct experience of like this, it's like, it's almost crazy that I, this is such a game changer for the way you're really operating. I've got everything on my phone and I, all I had to do was set everything up in advance and then my director is just, I keep him happy and I don't have to worry. Mm -hmm. and, it, and I can, it, the best feeling is when he's about to turn to me and is like, he wants a light lowered and like, yeah. I'm already there, I'm already on it. Yeah. But um, yeah. Yeah, the, the, but I was afraid of like, oh, I could, like I said, I could, I could go, that's a rabbit hole that I could spend all day down. 100%. So, yeah. Thank you for I that. I've seen the initial prototype of Citus Link and like all that Citus Mesh technology. It was, we housed the technology of it inside of a little M9 chassis. Like we took the body of an, a guts out of an M9 and we put all the tech inside of an M9 just so we can play around with it. Yeah. So you're seeing how, what the timeline is for all of these different developments. It's, it's pretty long to get to where we need to go. So we need to be thinking about not what are users and just need right now, but also what they're going to need in the right. future. Or how can we solve something that no one has even thought about yet? That's what we're also trying to get to do. So, what's, so what is NAD 2024? What are you going to show us? I can't tell you just now. I can't tell you just yet. Maybe I don't even know yet, to be completely honest. No, the only thing I've ever been like, I wish yeah. they'd done this differently, was that the we love the MC, mm -hmm. the second generation, I wish you'd called it the MC squared. <laughs> That was a, that, would, that could have been cool. But other than that, and you know, I I, I, I got to wrap this up so yeah. that we we don't go forever because I could, I really could. But thank you so much, and you know, we're we we're all. It's always really exciting to see what Aperture is uh, bringing to the table, and it's it's also just really nice to catch up with everybody. So I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thanks for coming by the booth. Thank you. Thank you. We are here at the Condor Blue booth, and. Uh, not only have they been generous enough to let us sit on their stage, they've been generous enough to let us talk to their founder and CEO, <laughs> Lucas. I would love to talk to you about your your ethos, corporate ethos and, and philosophy. Really, I guess it's your personal ethos and philosophy. Yeah, we don't even use the word corporate around here. <laughs> um, I mean, 
We're only four years old, right? It started, I still own my production company for 15 years now. And it all started as me being a cinematographer, as our friend Michael here, shooting all kinds of projects, uh, indie films, commercials, uh, TV episodes. And it came to a point where I just was dabbling with gear and as some things that I wanted to make for myself. At the time I was sh uh, shooting with Black Magic and I was helping to test the Blackmagic Pocket 4K camera right. before it had come out and I realized that there needed to be a couple things that that camera really needed to put it into a professional workflow to be able to add accessories, to be able to power it with V-mount, to get Mini XLR was kind of relatively a new connection for the industry back then, for cameras at least. So some of these things just didn't exist and I needed them and so that's kind of how it all started is for my need of wanting to have some products and and next thing you know, these guys need it, these guys need it. So we're like, okay, let's do this for real and sh sh shipping worldwide. And But it all just started from what we need as filmmakers. And most of our team now are all filmmakers. Our head engineer knows filmmaking. He, a lot of the cameras here are his as well, Red Komodo. A customer support team, filmmakers or salespeople. So it just comes from that background of what do we want to use and put that out. But at the same time, when it came to actually, okay, let's, we can make a company out of this. I'm saying we, it was like me in my garage for two years alone. Yeah. <laughs> and that is a daunting thing to, to, to face, especially when, it, when you're doing it alone. Uh, I, it's funny, I didn't realize you started with trying to tinker on, on uh, the 4K. I got a 6K nice. and I bought the small rig cage. And I didn't know that it didn't, oh, I didn't realize when I was trying to put it on a, balance it on a gimbal, I was like, oh, I really need an Arca uh, like to slide base, the... and it didn't have that. I designed and machined my own nice. Arca base and then fell down that rabbit hole too. And then well, suddenly that's what we do, yeah. You're making all, all your own parts bespoke yeah. and it's really satisfying, but it's so much, I, I actually do know, because I do it myself, how much effort and work that is and how yeah. many prototypes you go through for an individual part. It's what we do. As filmmakers, we create, and creating rigs is actually super fun. I mean, we say it all the time. It's like Legos for filmmakers. You can build however you want. But I remember early on, just like, I need a dolly. I don't have money to buy like a full-fledged dolly, so let's just go to Home Depot, get some parts and some skateboard wheels and put it together, you know? That's, I think, that's the spirit that's inside of all of us. So now, w one of the things that, that you're known for is you also have a really tight relationship with a lot of the YouTubers. Um, you, you have a lot of them at your Airbnb, uh, th this show, uh, maybe all of them. Uh, <laughs> and, and you're deeply wired into that community. Uh, tell, tell me about that choice and what that's it, like. It just boils down to relationships. Like, for me, there are a lot of these, we've got some cool collabs like just behind here with I Justine and Gerald and Armando and some of these people that I've known for years and we just come to be friends first, trust each other as human beings first and see what can we do together, what can we do that's fun that we both can benefit from and the community can benefit from and no one's taking advantage of anybody and it's just a chill, authentic experience. Like it's been really cool to, the Condor booth has been like the place where everyone just comes, hangs out. Okay, they'll go to see Sony and they'll go see Canon or whatever, but then they come back and this is where you just hang out. This is home room. This is like the home base, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, we've been able to do that as well with, like you mentioned, the house that we're all staying in and with a bowling alley and just hanging out after we're a long day of staying at the, at the booth. But it's just, there's, there's not like one, key is just being yourself and having relationships. That's what is most important. So now, are they your beta testers? Uh, we've got a lot of people. So we're in California, so it's like the home of filmmaking. Right. So we'll send stuff to several YouTubers. We'll send stuff to a lot of ASC cinematographers and just friends. And obviously, we'll use all this stuff ourselves first and see if it's even worth sending out, right? But yeah, um, I mean, one of them is really good friends of mine, Armando Ferreira amazing friend and he literally lives like 20 minutes away from my house we didn't even know it until we figured it out and we're like oh you're so close let's go get let's you go get a bite to eat and restaurants and yeah wait. yeah you're literally right next and right yeah. down the street so yeah 
And then the relationship. What? Tell, talk, let's talk about the relationship you have with like the manufacturers of, of cameras and things. And, yeah. And what is that like? And how do you get to prototype yeah. against uh, upcoming things? Or do that's you? yeah. So the synergy again with camera manufacturers is beautiful because I and I've known several of these the contacts that I have with different big major brands because I was a cinematographer myself. There's been many times where they sponsored my projects back before Condor Blue even existed. So I've had friends for a long time in some of these, uh, like I said, I've even uh, beta tested some of the sensors early on. So when it came to when we we're gonna make Condor Blue, it was like, hey, we already know all these people. They already trust me. They know what I'm about. And again, it comes down to the relationships. That's the most important thing. And that's why I love NAB because this is where you get to meet new people or see faces that you've maybe only emailed before, have conversations that really start to shape everything. Last year was my first in AB and the first afternoon was a bit of a shock when I saw, I was like, this looks like the front page of my YouTube, just walking uh, by at our in booth. 3D everywhere. These all these the, the all the the people I subscribe to, <laughs> all, every channel was just like whoop whoop whoop. Yeah, and that was that was pretty amazing. And then the, the, then everything flocking. It it is kind of funny. This booth uh, gets when you got someone, they the just the crowd that gathers. It looks yeah. like a little bit like this little mini rock concert. Yeah, it's been awesome, and obviously we built a stage so we can kind of have conversations with all of our friends and all of our creators, uh, brands that we've invited to with the, the stage. With the orbit always circling. 360 going on to show off. That's That was a Josh. done with my good friend Josh, and we helped him create some of the hardware for it. But yeah, I mean, you we talked earlier about like DIY and building things yourself. This whole booth was DIY. We built this entire thing ourselves in our California warehouse all of our team painting walls and hammering and figuring you out how to, how to put the LED lights and backlight everything. and Any other choice would have just felt wrong. Thing. Well, it's right. us, right? Yeah. It's us. We really want to make sure that we can bring our vibe and our style here. And if you go to California to visit our showroom, it looks like this. It's like um, we wanted to bring this to, to Las Vegas and give people a style of what we are. There's a lot of booths out there and they kind of look a little cookie cutter if you ask me. They do. Um, I, I think one of the things that a lot of times, because, and I, I think a lot of, of, of your, your customer base and a lot of the audiences for these YouTube channels are, are passionate enthusiasts all around the world. And, and I know from personal experience, sometimes you have this idea that, it, that all of this is like just this vast giant thing that's very far away. But when you start to, to really dive into this, you realize, like you were talking about, the the industry is tiny, like yeah. really tiny, and all these personal relationships are that, that. In some ways, it's really easy to think that they'd be impossible and are, and are uh, very distant and and just sort of a dream. Or actually, everybody's really just kind of just like yeah. we're all. Everybody's connected. Everyone's the same. They all have similar passions and goals. And but even if they are far away and on on the planet and different sides of different countries. This is a great place where everyone just comes together and connects. Yeah. Like, just, I mean, you're, you're mentioning the house that we have where we're housing influencers and all of our team and just hanging out. Like last year, we did that as well, and that was where some of the influencers connected. And over the last year, they've done a bunch of collabs together themselves. And it's just, we just want to be able to bring people together, and cool stuff happens when you can do that. Yeah. I think one of the funniest things I heard about that was like someone was talking about asking, well, is it really crazy over there with all these these guys? Is it just like a, an insane party? And someone's like, well, you know, Josh and Gerald have kids yeah, and, no. and their families are here. And it's sort of like, it, it changes the vibe. Well, it's, a, it's about family too. Yeah, I mean, we, we want to bring people together, but we never go and we never get crazy. It's about this, it's about yeah. conversation. So we'll, we'll create a cool environment and we've got bowling alleys and hot tubs and pool tables and all kinds of crazy stuff at the house. But and people enjoy themselves, but everyone's mostly com having conversations and We're getting to know each other more. <laughs> and yeah, talking about cameras and talking about family. And yeah, I'm a dad with four kids, and so family's important to me. And if they want to bring their kids and their wives, amazing. So yeah, it's it's more chill and it's more family-like. It's not like a crazy rager or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much. I I, I really love that we're we're able to like give a human face to to this in a this this strange spectacle that is in a b <laughs> and and thank you so much for taking the time yeah. uh to talk with us yeah absolutely i mean when i when i first started the company it was 
there's a couple core things that I wanted to make sure we did differently because I was a customer of all the other brands that might be out there and I had the experiences and I'm like, if I'm gonna do it, I'm not, we're not gonna just be another brand. We have to be able to stand out and offer what I never got when I was a customer, which is a lifetime warranty. We stand behind everything we make. If you, even down to a little HDMI cable, if it were to break, you get a new one. Like literally, anything that happens, you get back to, you get customer support from filmmakers. People literally call us and reach out to us to troubleshoot something that like, say small rig, for example, a follow focus. We don't make follow focus. They're like, we can't get a hold of them. It's fine, they'll call us, we'll go on their website. I, I tell my whole team, let's just be helpful. We're filmmakers, how would you like to be treated? And let's help them. It doesn't matter if they buy from us or not. Let's, let's be that place where we can, they know that they have support regardless. So because that's, it is a that's small what, industry and you're in it for the long game. Yeah, and, and like you like, said, everybody knows everybody. You have to be real, authentic, and kind. And yeah, good things happen. They really do, don't they? Yeah. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. We're back at the RA booth, uh, trying to squeeze an interview in before the band comes back. I'm gonna. I'm here with Art Adams and an absolute king's ransom of lenses here. But but to Ari, even more valuable to the than the lenses is art. He is, in many ways, arguably the face of RE color science. And that's kind of what I'd love to talk to you about. Okay. Um, color science is one of those things that we're talking about constantly, and I don't think we always really fully understand. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, so do you want to maybe, how would you, can you put that in a nutshell, how we should, uh, should be thinking about color science? Um, wow, that's a big question. I mean, I can talk a little bit about how we do it, it's interesting if you look at uh, a lot of different companies, you can see the roots of their look in their background. So, for example, if, uh, if they come out of broadcast, you know, they usually have all the, the legacy broadcast controls in there, even if you don't really need them anymore. And maybe the, it, it, there's a very different look, and it's a little hard to quantify. And it can be very beautiful, but it's, it's different from what we've done, because we came from film scanners. So right. everything we know is from looking at you know emulsion and celluloid, and we don't try to make a digital film stock or like a specific film stock. We try to distill the essence of what film does, and there's a lot of research behind film and why film looks good, and we we've drawn on that. Um, I think uh, yeah, we've just taken our inspiration from film, so we have a very different look, a very different idea of how the workflow should happen. Yeah. And it's a deep institutional knowledge that's required to even emulate that. You know, it's, it's funny, we always talk about emulation and recipes and these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And it's not, a, and a film stock doesn't just give you the same thing every time. It depends on how you develop and, how, and, and your whole process. And then there are all these historical factors in terms of why it looked like this way on this film and this mm -hmm. way on that film, et cetera, et cetera. Bringing that to bear on what you're doing in digital. What is that like and what is your th thought process around that? It, it's really interesting because on the, on the one hand you're trying to make things as perceptually accurate as you, as you can, at least that's our philosophy, but at the same time there's a little magic in there that makes it beautiful because you don't want to, there's a difference between communicating reality and, there's a and communicating kind of a beautiful version of reality. And I don't know enough about it to really explain it because there's so much psychology behind it. it it's funny. Um, I, when I saw Empire of Light, mm -hmm. Roger Dinkinson's most recent film, it was like, it almost made me angry how, how beautiful everything was because it's like, it looks like he showed up on set and it's like, everything looks natural and good. It's like he doesn't, didn't do anything, but you know he worked so hard for it. And then you're like, it feels like absolutely nat what you just said it feels absolutely natural except you're like but i don't think that is actually natural right. it it's the feel of natural it's it's like how you would remember it later as yeah. being natural the dream of natural uh, because stuff was glowing that shouldn't glow but yeah in your heart it glows in your in, in your memory it glows and mm -hmm. and those shadows have this at this rich detail that you feel like you can't quite see it but you can re you if you could just reach into it you, you know yeah. and it's like but it it's it's how some and and uh, uh, I don't know it, it's like the the feel of it the the feel of the authenticity mm -hmm. um, and but but then to take all of that to take that woo woo s strange stuff and then to turn it into the way your sensor is going to be interpreted by your trip 
you know, and that's something that a bunch of engineers are going to be doing, but that's going to be guided by by your eye and and a number of other key people who who have that. I remember last year when you were showing debuting the Alexa 35. Mm -hmm. We were standing in front of a monitor, monitor with a live feed, and you started talking about certain colors in that image and 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 how you would go and say say, say like look at it and be give notes to the engineers and say this this hue this shade should be a little different in a certain way and my feeling at the time was how is it that i mean you how what i was struck by was that you are seeing that image radically differently than most people are and, and your brain is like analyzing it in a way that i like how do i do that and how how what what how how well do i need to be able to do that to to practice my craft i was a little just intimidated and, and jealous, but, but what is it, how have you come to that point? A lot of it is just experience, and, and you know, when we do this all, I mean, the, the, the people in Munich who do this, this stuff are, are just, they're geniuses, but it's nice because they make it collaborative, and early on when I was testing this camera, for example, there was one shot, I, I shot of a, a park in San Francisco, and this uh, person walked through with like a red uh, sweatpants, and the red was a little bit more saturated or zingy than I than I would like. And I just sent a little note over and said, you know, maybe it's worth taking a look at this. What do you think? And about a month later, they sent another version of the let back and said, what do you think of this? And I'm like, oh, I like that better. So we, we're all kind of bouncing this around. I mean, a lot of what they do, it, it's finished by the time I see it. But it's nice that they ask for notes from us because then we can kind of contribute with a different eye because they are very good at color but they're also not necessarily industry professionals at least not in like um, you know cinematographers yeah so they but they they seek a lot of feedback and it's funny one, one thing you mentioned uh, reminded me of a lighting analogy so if uh, if I've got a situation where there's very strong light coming from one direction the the thing that a lot of people will do instinctually or that they're taught is you put a bounce card over here to, to, yeah. to get it back or to fill in the shadows. But if it's too far around, you end up with this dark line down the center of the face, like the, the eyes go a little dark. So you get this feeling of there's a light here and there's a bounce card here and there's something missing right here. And something I learned from a DP I was working with on a TV series is he would, instead of putting a light here, he would put it over here and take basically this light and wrap it around with another light and then let this drop off. Now, that's not the way it would really work, but it looks great, and it looks real. But it's a little trick that almost never happens in nature. Right. So there's a lot of those little things, I think, that go on where it's, it's like what you were saying. It's, it's things that we remember or things that we think should work right um, that look natural, but if you really pay attention, maybe it's not as real as we expect it to be or it, it, as it, it is in the, in the world. It's funny. We call it color science. We should be color, calling it color art because there, there's this intent there, and it's, color, it's an interpretation. Well, yeah, it's more color psychology. Like, you know, the, how do you communicate color as an idea in a way that's pleasing to another person? And in our case, what we're trying to do is create an image that, that's beautiful on its own, but you, you can also push in lots of different directions. And since we do camera systems. You know, for example, the lenses play a part in that too. So the lenses were designed around the Alexa 35 sensor because we, we knew it was coming. And okay. they, have a certain, they have certain qualities that really allow, allow you to get the most out of that sensor. And right. I don't know what um, Roger Deakins, I think he's shooting, I don't know if that was, I think that was probably Mini LF and Signature Primes. Not certain. Yeah, but he tends to, he, he shoots with airy cameras, and, and, and he he loves these lenses. The, you you've made the choice to because you're of, of the way you you're, who who your customers are to really provide a, a neutral, very clean image. You know, it, but it's funny people say that because they think that's who we are. But if you look at this, we actually had to go to a completely new contractor to make these because we don't design or, or manufacture the lens business. We're not big enough to do that. But we designed the look. And the look oh, okay. that we wanted for these is so different that we had to go to a, a company that had never made cinema lenses before because they didn't fight us. Other companies were like saying, like, you, you don't make a cinema lens this way. This is so interesting. I, now I feel like I need to walk back to the thing I said 
when I was talking about character lenses and characters, I was like, yeah, like you'll never get fired for choosing uh, Ari's. And I was like, but I don't. Maybe you'll never get like be, be called a genius for choosing Ari's either, because it's like an, it's a really easy choice to make. Well, like in the, but in the case maybe of, I'm wrong. Maybe there is a lot of. Well, in the case of Roger Deakins, you know, he takes Aerie cameras and Aerie lenses, and he makes so many different movies, so many different looks out of them. And that's one of the things that we we try to do is empower people to start with a, a beautiful image, but then you can push it anywhere you want. And so, so neutral is the wrong word. It's more more flexible might be a better. I think that's a much better word because they're not flexible. really neutral lenses. If you look at them, the color is very accurate, but they're also a little bit warm. They pop skin very nicely. At the point of focus, they capture every detail. But uh, there's one DP who described it really, uh, really well. He said it's like looking through a beautiful lens, or no, look, looking through a beautiful window, which I think is a great. You know, uh, description because they do feel very real. Because in the past we were looking more at film and what film required, and now we're looking at HDR and what's going to be relevant in 20 years. And that's where these lenses are focused. It's a very realistic image. Um, I mean, not necessarily, but you know, that's the hardest thing to do is to create a really beautiful, realistic image. You can always carve things away, and that's you can do that in color correction. You can do that with these filters. You're starting with uh, everything you want, everything you can get, and then pulling things out of it to create the look that you want. Yeah, and that's really what all this stuff is based around. Like not locking people in, not being super clean, but at the same time delivering the best image we can give you. So then you can make it into what you want it to be. And that's hard. And that's what, what I've discovered working for this company is that's what we do is we go for the hard stuff. There's a lot of other stuff that you can do. You can make your own lens. You can okay. make a really funky lens, but it'll only ever do one thing. Or you can push it around and, and make it. And that's a valid choice. That's perfectly valid. But what we try to do is we make really, really, really high performance lenses that will live at that extreme. Mm -hmm. But then you can also carve stuff out of and create different looks yeah. that way. Gotcha. Yeah, I, it, it's funny. I. I used to think when people were saying, oh, it's too sharp, it's clinically sharp, um, that they were just really, they, they couldn't afford sharp lenses and they were just sort of making excuses. But then I saw some films where I was like, oh, wow, that is actually kind of off-putting or not appropriate to, to the feel of that film. Mm -hmm. I, I wish it, it was, was softer. Uh, I think last year, last year I ended up, <laughs> I ended up seeing... Um, uh, Cyrano, I saw Cyrano three times. The second time was to admire the, uh, the, the highlight roll off oh, on, on the Alexa. And the third time was actually because it has the, the most beautiful focus pull I've ever seen. And you shouldn't ever notice a focus pull, but this one was like, oh, it's, it made me, I'm, focus pull that made me cry. I will oh, just wow. say that at the very end. Um, and I went and I saw Belfast twice to watch the the highlight roll off of the Alexa, mm -hmm. um, but um, I and I and I, I the out, I saw the outfit which is a period piece mm -hmm. and it was shot with an extreme it was a re I loved the movie I, mm -hmm. I I really love Mark Rylance but it was shot incredibly sharp mm -hmm. and it felt as a period piece I was just like this is why. Why is everything this sharp? And it just it, it, it didn't feel like it was of the time, and it and, and it well, really took me out of it. Well, it depends. So, well, there's different kinds of sharpness, and well, I we, love when you say stuff like that because I'm like I'm about to learn a thing. Yeah, uh, well, and, and I I, I you know I learned it as well uh, when I was started with Ari and I started kind of reverse engineering the look of these to kind of figure out how to quantify it. And I learned that, like for example, master primes are designed to deliver the best image the film can handle. And that is all about delivering really high contrast with coarse, big, you know, large details. Okay. Because that's where film really lives. And it, it's a very high resolution lens, but at some point it kind of rolls off those fine details. So the coarse details kind of pop more. So that's why some people say, oh, maybe Master Primes feel a little crispy. Although it's interesting if you open them up to, you know, you shoot wide open on them, you actually get a little softness to them, which is why that's what a lot of people in TV are doing now. Because they're really good lenses and wide open, they're just a little, take the edge off just a little bit. And this is one of those things is you, what, learning what your lens can do in, di in different setups and, in, right. and what you can do with your lens by adjusting, making, making choices with your lens. And I guess 
creating a lens that gives you cho those, those sorts of choices, but then you still have to master that. Yes, like for example, on these uh, wide open, uh, there's a very slight uh, glow of spherical aberration, and there's a DP I know who actually uses that. He says, it's gone by T2, but I, right. I use that sometimes at T1.8, and you really have to look for it, but his eye is that good. That and now, why is it, what does he want out of that? Um, just a, just a very slight, yeah, just a just slight, a very slightly it? different look. But I was going to say about the, the sharpness in, in these lenses, I don't, they don't feel sharp. To me, they feel clear, and that's because the MTF is so high all the way down into the, the really fine detail range. The MTF? Yeah, the, I mean, the, 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 the measure of contrast. Ah, so okay. the very fine details have a lot of contrast as well. And you would think that would make the lens feel sharper. It actually makes it feel more natural and more real like you're just seeing it. So you're not punching one thing, you're kind of trying to carry as much of the detail as you can. And strangely, it makes people look better. And these things make people look basically like if you're just looking at them. But it doesn't accentuate, make them look crispy sharp. It's right. just a very natural feel with a little bit of extra warmth. And then we also worked on the background, the out-of-focus parts of the image, as much as we did on the in-focus parts, so that uh, people don't, they don't look sharp, they just look clear, and then they pop against a background that's very soft and smooth and has no hard edges to it. So there's a real science to how the, the product manager specced out these lenses for their specific look. And it's a very different look. Now, when you say you worked on that, you know, the engineers, when, when you give them that goal, mm -hmm. do they then, are they like trying to find a set of, you know, a combination of elements that will suddenly do that? Like, uh, is there an element in there that, like, this is why the background is the way it is? That's an interesting question. Well, yeah, the background is because they're very, very, very well corrected for spherical aberration, which is really diff difficult to do. And actually, these filters reintroduce spherical aberration into the lens so that you can have it if you want it. Uh, okay. Which is what a lot of vintage lenses, when you push those elements around, a lot of what you're introducing is spherical aberration. So we can actually do that on the back of the lens because the lens is designed, it's so high performance, you can, you can throw it off in a way just by putting an extra piece of glass in. But um, yeah, I, and it, it, it's a, the way they describe it to me is that the lens is not completely free of aberrations because you can't do that yet, or you can do it, but it's, it'll be a really big expensive lens. Yeah. It's more about you're balancing the aberrations in a way that you find pleasing. In the same way that you know, color science, when you push colors around, you want accuracy, but you also mix in a little bit of uh, something else to make it less, it looks real, but it doesn't look dull or right. lifeless or clinical or like just exactly like reality. Yeah. And I think sometimes what people don't realize, that they think there should just be a, a perfect color science, but you're taking raw data from a sensor that doesn't really know that it's even looking at light, mm -hmm. and you have to make decisions about how to interpret it and, re and, and put it back together as an image. It's, mm -hmm. it, a raw, raw, da raw is, isn't anything until you do something with it. Right. And, and that, there's so many things you can do with it, so many different things. And that, that's why the yeah. Alexa 35 is so interesting, is because the, the, the way you take the colors from the sensor and plot them into a color space and manipulate them is really critical. And the 35 uses a model that, uh, of doing that that nobody's ever used in a camera before. And perceptually, it's the most accurate Welcome thing I've ever seen. I think, I think the band is about to come on, so thank you so much for joining us. Okay, so I'm here with Brady Bissett, whose YouTube channel is Brady Bissett, uh, and thank you for taking the time thank to you. chat with us. Uh, you are in Utah now. I am. I'm in Salt Lake City, Utah. And you have really built up your uh, from you. You came up through Utah, YouTube, and you've really built up a real presence. Aperture has brought you out here, and in the, that, and they brought you out last year. That's got to be very exciting. And so you've seen a certain level of success. Yeah. What I wanted to talk to you about today is you see a lot. Some YouTubers. We all start out with this filmmaker dream, uh -huh. and then a lot of us sort of discover, wow, the YouTube thing really works, and sometimes that becomes just the thing they do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But for you, and my understanding is, you're also very interested in, you have in, still in the filmmaker part of it. 
and uh, I would love to hear your thoughts about how you balance those two and what YouTube has done for you, how it's presented extra challenges. Do you, you know, does that, that, does that present a credibility problem or has it given you open doors that would never otherwise have been available? And I should say, for anyone who doesn't know his channel, check it out. It's fantastic uh, educational content in a space where, what I think I, I to just fanboy a little bit, not only it does the lighting setups that he shows, like they're, they're great setups, and, but you do a really great job of making it feel like, oh, not only do I understand how to do this, I feel like I can go out and do that and I don't have to spend a million dollars to well, achieve a, a result. Uh, and I think that's why you've, you've seen a lot of the success you have in terms of, of people really being attracted to that content and Aperture yeah. recognizing that like, there, there's real value there. Yeah. There can also maybe be a rabbit hole. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, I try to keep things achievable in a sense, because that's like the mm. world that I came up in. It's like, what's, what's relatively budget friendly and achievable? Mm. So trying to take that and it's kind of transitioned into a little bit of my style as well yeah. of just not having to overcomplicate it. We can right. do things with myself and a gaffer. We can do things with a team of five. We don't need a 30 man crew. And just keeping it kind of like in a realistic wheelhouse, especially if you're in your first five years of the career. Yeah, and that really ends up speaking well to to the crowd that is trying to do things indie. You know, and I just I moved to LA about a year ago, and and it's very different. And I do now. I'm like, oh, I would do things very differently with c this kind of community around me. But mm -hmm. when I was in in the Bay, that didn't exist, and that these these sorts of channels become a bit of a lifeline. Mm -hmm. But getting back to you also are. It, you know, you're not just YouTube. You really want to do a lot of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. Tell me how how this this whole journey has been in terms yeah. of that path. I would say it's really untraditional, and I I wouldn't say it's one worth repeating, a path worth repeating. But pretty much, I started through like this interest in videography. I mean, I've done stills for as far, far back as 12 years. I started with strictly mm -hmm. photography. Went seven years before I even hit a record button really essentially. Okay. Um, so then it wasn't until like 2017, 2018 where I was like, let's vlog. Like Sam Colder, Peter McKinnon era, like let's do that. <laughs> where completely not my style now, but there was this era of like, this is what I want to do. Where that died out the second I realized like everybody's doing this. Okay. I wasn't, I didn't have the talent or knowledge to make it relevant. So I just kind of dropped off, kept doing videography stuff. And it wasn't until about 2019 where I found out that I liked the production side of things. I was PA, kind of swing on a like indie film. Um, and this wasn't in Utah. Where were no, you? This you were was, on the East Coast at that at time. At this point, I was living in Florida, actually. Okay. So this was all happening there, and that's where I really learned like lighting a little bit, or like learned what a C stand was, learned kind of like three point lighting, kind of thing yeah. like that. Yeah. And this was late 2018, early 2019. Like relatively, it seems stuff. like ancient history, but it really wasn't. Yeah, it, was, it almost feels fast. like it was yesterday. It went fast for sure, um, but that kind of sparked my interest for the cinematography side of things. With my photography, right. my style was always pushing it creative, towards like really uh, uh, push towards that cold feeling if I felt like cold or dark if it felt like adding to the emotion or feeling. So with my cinematography interest growing, that's kind of where that came into play as well. Um, but then COVID came, I, I left a marketing job. Uh, like a photo video marketing job right at the beginning okay. of COVID. And I was just kind of on my own and I was like, I want to do film. I don't really know what I'm doing. I know some knowledge. I got bored. I was like, what if I post to YouTube? In right. the meantime, no expectations. And immediately it ramped up. So I was like, oh, okay. there's something to be had here. I didn't know what it was yet, but I was like, okay, I got to keep doing this. And you don't have to know yeah. in that stage you just like, there's something here, let's find out what uh -huh. it is. Right? I've been asked a few times, like, what was your strategy? And I was like, that's a good question. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I had no strategy at all for it. Um, but then I started to realize that that was like an educational opportunity, not only for the viewers, but for myself. So I was yeah. having to teach a topic, but in order to teach it, I, I needed to make sure I knew it. So I was finding myself trying things and learning as I went. So that improved my skill set as a cinematographer as well. That's something that comes through in the channel too, is that you are on a journey in the path and you're figuring things out. I feel like that also, to a lot of your, the audience, ends up making it feel more accessible. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's a, a point of connection. Yeah, and there's been growth for sure. I remember there was a point where, uh, this is when Aperture so gratefully came into the picture. Um, 
I was at a point of growth where I was using a Nova, but I was putting it through a bed sheet held up by a PVC pipe. And I had this second of like, I'm using this beautiful light through a sheet for diffusion. I was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta like evolve a little yeah. bit or like, you know, grow with my uh, but also, gear that I'm using. You know, when you listen to the old, go back to those old indie mogul podcasts that Ted's doing and uh -huh. you find out like, yeah, that that is a, that is a well-worn tradition, right? Yes, yes, it definitely is. Um, but it, it's it's been a journey of, I guess, growth through the channel mm -hmm. and stuff, but it's this really weird balancing act of filmmaking and YouTube, because they're two yes, very separate really entities. They're blending together right now, but they're still very separate. So I've been balancing on that line of like, my pride is like, I want to be a DP. I don't want to just do YouTube, but I love YouTube. I love the community that I've grown with. I love the people in it. I love the flexibility, etc. Right. So it's like balancing this really fine line. Yeah. So I, I was really curious about that. Now, now you moved to Utah. Tell, Correct. And is that for career reasons? Yeah, it was kind of for career reasons. I just uh, I was ready. I was outgrown Vermont work scene because that's where I was at the time. Mm -hmm. It's Vermont, and there's just not a big film industry. So I was ready to kind of blossom into the next thing. Um, so I was like, Utah has got a film industry. It's not the best in the country. Obviously, we kind of know LA is the place to be, but I loved the community that was based around it. So you I went out. Built, you have built community there. Yeah, and even when I first went out, I met a few people, and they were all just down to do things, just up to go for it. So I was just like, all right, Utah looks cool. It's beautiful. It's got film. I didn't put much thought into it. Yeah. It was just there. No, that's great. Yeah. Well, it seems like you'll just make bold choices mm -hmm. and and you're recognizing that this is an adventure you're on like l enjoy the journey yeah um i, I was i remember driving through because i drove it's just me in the moving truck and a car on okay. a trailer behind wow and i was driving through illinois or somewhere like that in the midwest i was like i'm i guess i'm doing this yeah like, i'm just moving to utah and i didn't know anybody more than like a couple conversations right so it's just like all right here we so, go i guess so getting work in the industry and working on set, how does the uh, how does the YouTube stuff end up playing? I think that it, they go hand in hand in a way. Um, the more industry work that I do, the more of a resource it is for my YouTube education. Um, I never want to pick one over the other. I've thought a lot back and forth of like, do I just go full time YouTube, or do I drop the YouTube and go full time into the industry? Because that's like, and you want to straddle that line. I want to straddle they, that line. They both speak to you. They both speak to me because I and in different ways. In different ways. I love I love doing it. I love the the film industry. It's amazing, especially growing into it. But I like the teaching side of thing, and I like the flexibility of YouTube as well. Right. That's definitely a benefit um, that I love, and I love the community side of it. That's but it's awesome. hard because there's there's a lot of stigmas in the film industry looking in at those in the YouTube industry of like the YouTube is this someone to take seriously stuff. like a lot of people in the industry a lot of uh, especially like more of the older like the uh, higher seniorities they'll be like people on YouTube are just like kids with you know <laughs> kids little with cameras. cameras yeah uh, they yeah. don't know anything but that line is blending a little bit but it's it's interesting trying to strategically straddle that and you know. Right. come across, I guess, ideal in both sides. Right. And I think at the end of the day, the work speaks for itself. Well, thank you. Right. Um, well, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm of I'm, I really appreciate that, and I'm sure we'll have a lot more conversations. But do you have any closing advice for, say, a young YouTuber out there who looks at that and is like, mm -hmm. yeah. I think that there's a lot of comparison, at least for me, there's always been a lot of comparison. Maybe it's because I started young, so I got looked mm -hmm. at as the young kid with a camera. Um, so it always, I always had to justify myself to myself that I was like good enough, but kind of ignoring that is, is, would have been helpful for me to know a little bit further back. I don't need to be this top of the line professional, like yeah. high and mighty guy, I guess I can just be me and like, you know, create this community and make friends and not be scared to reach out to people. And, yep. and, and I've seen now that I've moved to LA, one element of success is you see sometimes people come in and representing themselves as more than they are and, and, and a lot of luster. Yeah. And the people people want to work with are the ones who are like, because we've all been yeah. a that beginner That was the thing that I noticed point. most. I came into the industry now, like meeting people very much better than me. Yeah. That was, it was so intimidating. And then I'd find myself having a relatable conversation yeah. about the same thing. Yeah. And as long as you're not trying to pretend, uh -huh. people are very welcoming and they're like, oh, we know, we know what it's like to be, and, and we can relate to it and, and 
and yeah. a lot of people are really welcoming of people coming up. That's what, because I've got a friend, he's in the CSC, the Canadian Society of yeah. uh, Cinematographers, and he spent time telling me, first of all, just like saying, your stuff is good, but why don't you try doing this? Right. In such a, like, a constructive criticism yeah. way. And I'm like, why are you telling me this? But then he's also having conversations of like, I met this person that is so much better than me. That was so intimidating. I don't Someone know anything. Else, the, the, and I'm like, do you, you see up. your work? Yeah. So it's like, it's always this ladder. We're all doing the same thing, which is, it's inspiring and motivating once you get into the industry and realize that. And, and that's one of the things I, I like most about film is it is collaborative and it's an opportunity to play with like-minded people. Yes, and like, 100%. at its best, it feels like play. Yes, 100%. Right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, have a great it. show. Uh, don't wear yourself out too much. I know. Yeah, it's oh, Vegas, and I bet you wear yourself out 100. We are, yeah. <laughs> the, we're we're almost at the end, but almost. Uh, not there yet. Not there yet. We'll the be finish there line is like far. Anyway, thank thank you so hey, much. Thank I you. Really I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. It is the end of the show. NAB 2023 has come to a co close, and they are rolling up the carpets as we speak. So. I could be interviewing you and pretend we don't know each other, but the truth is, I've been running around doing these interviews, putting a human face in all of these different companies. Yeah. We, this, is, this is the company that made, all, made this whole series possible, right. uh, and we, we know each other very well. So the story is, I came here about a year ago to LA with this dream of, of making films and landed in your lap at Cinema Devices because I thought this was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And then we started geeking out and talk about everything under the sun film. This guy too, come on in. We're all, it, it, when we talk about filmmaking being like a, so often like family companies, this is what it's like and this is really, really family here. These people have been my community in LA and, and I will say, to all of the aspiring filmmakers who are thinking about, who have a dream of, of doing any of this, you hear about LA being a daunting place, right? Um, it is, it can be, if you fail to build community. But if you do, you find very quickly that, that the entire ecosystem of film, film out here is one in which we're all here to collaboratively play. And when you build community, and f they, they, they become family very quickly. And it becomes just the best place in the world. It, it definitely can be, be incredibly intimidating if you don't, but that exists here. And I owe my whole existence in LA the way it is today to these guys. This is, this is Ariel Benaroche and Adam Teichman. They are the, the driving forces behind uh, Cinema Devices. Adam invents and engineers insane cool things that you're not gonna find anywhere else. Um, and we haven't really been talking about tech specs in any of these interviews. And you haven't even, I haven't even started interviewing you guys. But um, this is your new product, the Exoboom, where we're giving love to the most, it was so funny, um, I, we, I said this the other day in an interview, but uh, we're finally giving sound guys some love and the sound guy on the interview was just, it, I, he became verklempt. He was just like, he was like, oh, finally, this is great. Uh, so uh, that, it, but please tell, talk about a little bit about just the vision of the company and what, why you have gone through all of the trials and tribulations that you have in the past few years for this dream. Well, you know, one of the things that people want to want to invent things, I'm saying, make sure you want one. So, I mean, as Garrett Brown's always said that. Um, Garrett Brown is the Gar inventor. Garrett Brown is the inventor of the Steadicam. And, uh, you know, so I was driven by the passion of wanting to be able to get these incredible production values and moves. After I broke out of the narrative scripted world into the documentary world, one in particular I was shooting that, that dance uh, documentary called Life uh, um, um, Breath Made Visible. With Anna and Halperin. With Anna Halperin. And we were, you know, here I am by the, in the sea branch by the cliffs with these gorgeous dancers and they're moving and just had this fantasy of being able to get something remote, body mounted out there that would do this. And I was working tirelessly because this was, I don't know, 2010 I was doing this. So I was working tirelessly for years to come up with a system and when um, the gimbals came out, which was a remote head that didn't require a pendulum, I realized 
then I could shift gears and build something that would get something to move in a way that nobody else was doing it. Um, and so you, to do it, you have to find a hundred ways that, that not to do it. So then so, you started in your garage noodling right. on what became this. Right. And then from there, you met up some other inventors and helped them with their engineering for yeah. the uh, that's right the ZG and the Ergo rig. Right. I was approached with concepts and even some you know in, in Charles's case, he actually had a working Charles prototype. Pappert. Charles Pappert had a uh, who's legendary a, steady cam lens. Yes, he's a legendary OG steady cam. Very respected. It was honored that he came to me, and um, he actually had a working prototype. And um, I was able to um, immediately lock into what he was doing because I had something very similar. I had built a suspend, and I just realized I had to put that on a pin. So it worked out very well to, um, in a fairly short amount of time, be able to design and engineer something that he would everything that he wanted and Neil wanted. That Neil Bryant, who was the operator on all the Last of Us and who's done all our promos, and. You know, stuck very close to them and came up with something that worked really well. That you know, was, and now yeah. the ZG is having its moment because of the Last That's of right. Us. We la it launched a year or two ago. It launched, uh, yeah, it, la it launched in the in the spring of twenty twenty one, but um, and you know, we tapped into an ecosystem that, of course, is super well established, and because of Charles and who he was and everything, a lot of people, the visionaries, were you know, we sold about a, over a hundred of them. So, um, and, yeah. And just to jump, so the ZG, the ZG basically, Steadicam, Garrett Brown's invention, industry standard, does one thing fantastic, which is Steadicam. The flowy, smooth, you know, uh, Ewok on the, yeah. on the Star Wars thing. But if you're trying to get anything other than that, it's very difficult because you're, you're, you're fighting it. And it's not gonna. And so if you want to get something more handheld, uh, a different kind of dynamic, you can't do it with that tool. So the ZG basically allows you to create real handheld look, having using the Steadicam's boom ability and its footstep isolation and stability. Yeah. Uh, and, and allows to expand what a Steadicam operator is does, allowing him to use his body in the way that he usually does it as opposed to have to having it on his, to right. have to have the camera on his shoulder. And now I think what's interesting there is I was in the, the shop when Neil came by one day and he talked about how, you know, on The Last of Us, which has allowed this to get a lot of traction now, people seeing that, uh, it ended up just him bringing that out, let the, the, the people could see what it could do and they, it kind of shaped the look of the show sure. in a significant way because That's right. and and not that the the creators of the show didn't have a vision but it actually let the, made their vision more accessible suddenly where they would have put things on sticks just because of the speed involved or the setup time they could suddenly get the shots that they would actually want if handheld like as is it, as it's enabled by the ZG became available to them and the ZG was what brought well, it Well they might have reach. shot it handheld but they would have beat the operators up and would any time... Well, not only that, but also yeah. it's a show where you have a, an adult, a 50-year-old man and a little girl. Right. And in the same shot, using the ZG, you can actually handhold and go from one to the other smoothly, move around, which is going to be very, very difficult in handheld work. And with the ZG, you can make it handheld and kinetic but not too handheld. You can chase, right. run after someone, lead someone, and it not be something that makes right. you want to throw right. up. Right, and, that, and that's one of the great things about this show, because a lot of people, if you see The Office, you'll notice they're never walking, they're always standing, and they're doing little things with the lens, but they're never really moving around. And a lot of times, handheld is very restrictive that way, or it gets too shaky. But here, you know, they had all the benefits of shooting at studio mode or Steadicam mode with that voyeuristic handheld feel. So it's the best of all worlds because they had the ability to do the types of moves that you get that aren't with handheld generally, but it still is an unmistakably handheld psychological feel. And that's where they get people get so excited about that because they get the best of that world along with all of the other things from the smooth studio world. So something I want to talk about that I've learned from uh, coming here and you know coming from it like this, I, 
thinking I could learn it all on YouTube and and yeah. and uh, this indie kind of thinking, which which has been wonderful and, and really inspiring. But then you get out to LA and you see how much the industry operates in very specific ways, uh, and and things don't necessarily change very quickly. But when you introduce and you can introduce innovations that, that are incredibly revolutionary to, to the look of a thing and they can change the way they, movies look and stuff. But it also can be incredibly challenging to, to get them adopted and understood for a while. Like I think Garrett Brown's Steadicam didn't, I mean, we now, the revisionist history is like, there was Rocky and then everyone was a Steadicam operator. Right. Uh, but well, there, his biggest problem was getting qualified operators because what happened, he was great at it. Um, he was the inventor, but you couldn't just take a steady cam out of a box and get a good shot. So when people bought them, and I even remember hiring people way back then, the horizon would be all over the place. You couldn't use the shot. And so what happened was is it, 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 they had an issue where the steady cam itself was available, but the producers were getting scared of it because they didn't know if they were going to get quality shots from it unless you happen to have one of three people. So then they were very reliant on training and getting people up to speed on it, which took a long time. It was a long learning curve. But for a Steadicam, it's like riding a unicycle and juggling. And that's where, um, you know, um, it, that's, that's what the hardest part of Steadicam was in getting it, until you got um, the operators, which was an elite core that was doing all the movies. Um, with the, and now with this rig, um, that's not, not as big an issue. We've had great anti success. The anti-gravity cam, we have had really good success um, where people right out of the box holding the ring can get really good footage and then they grow into the jib, they grow in the stuff, but the learning curve is not as steep. And we've had a lot of experienced uh, yeah. steady operators come by the booth this week yeah. and felt like they would. The, the learning curve on the ZG was incredibly shallow uh, and that they would be right. right out the gate, right? given what they know already about Steadicam. Right. Uh, that, that I think is, a, is, a, is worth pointing out. That's a pretty cool thing. Yeah. Uh, so I guess the last thing I would, I would want to know, or share with the audience is, you know, you've been doing this a very long time as an inventor. What keeps you going? What, what, what drives you to continue? Because I know you've got some other things yeah. in the pipeline. We'll see you at Cinegear. Um, what, how, what is that like for you? Well, I love doing something that hasn't been done. I love finding a niche and filling it. Um, looking at like uh, where people have gaps. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, uh, um, the biggest thing is just creating value. Yeah. Um, I could be if, if I was just you know money driven, I'd be in the stock exchange or real estate or something. This is, you know, and I know this is our reels the same way with me on this. You know, we came from working in the trenches as DPs. We understand what we're up against. So if you can make some, give somebody the option to get a shot that they just didn't have the time or the budget to get. Um, and even the bigger shoots have constraints, let's be real. And they're not gonna, they, if it takes a long time to go to a low mode or something like that, they may not do it. Um, I originally built the anti-gravity cam because I thought I was gonna be able, and I did give the independents and people with lower budgets an opportunity to create shots that were, you know, they wouldn't have to be able money or time to do. But then the A-listers like Matty Libatique who has like three systems with Chris, you know, Hair, um, they um, you know are using it with other devices and cranes and everything because it is fast and the actors aren't waiting and they keep the flow moving on the set and he's getting shots he wouldn't otherwise get. Right. Like a Star is Born is an example where they followed Bradley Cooper's feet out of the truck, went through a garage, a low door, came up overhead. Um, what Scott Sakamoto told me he was on wheels on that shot says he couldn't have done that on a steady cam. Um, right. I don't even know if the, some of the, uh, the Trinity or the Ayers would do that just because of the um, limitations where the arm was. So they were able to um, get these shots and when I hear stories like that, of course that makes my day. You right. know? Um, when I hear the small filmmakers, um, like another example, John Connor did this trilogy which was, um, had to be shot, they had to really motor through these setups and this is a war movie and everything, and he was operating. Um, and he did a combination of the handheld look along with the very smooth gimbal on the jib, 
And he said it was as soon as he got this, he was able to reboard the whole film. He could really do what he wanted to do. And for him, it was a huge confidence builder that he knew he could get the shots and he could design these things where he was up against it and he may have not been able to. And I remember shooting episodics in the 90s where I just did not have time to do. A lot of times, if I wanted a moving shot, I had to throw the zoom on. You know, we didn't have time to, you know, we had to lay track because there was no time on a surface. You know, and when you lay track, you're locked in. You're not going to just do a slight right. adjustment on the dolly. Um, and now you're on the zoom and you're burying things into the, the lateral moves into the zoom and things like that. And a lot of times you just didn't have time you had to find another way to shoot it. Um, and I, you know, having something that is on a, like a that plane of existence where you're just steadily moving and just transporting the audience in a very smooth way without having to lock yourself in is a tremendous freedom and um, confidence builder. So that's a great way to look at it. So when I hear yeah. stories like that, I'm thrilled. And, and one of the things I, we, we've definitely experienced, in, uh, and you mentioned like the little guys, w w our most popular product with the little guys is the Ergo Rig, which our cameraman right now yeah. is on. So why don't you step into our master <laughs> shot? Oh, okay, there you uh, go. It, it's Shoot funny, yourself. we brought Michael out from New York to help us out. Who's also an anti-gravity cam operator. Anti-gravity yes. operator, but he has an ergo rig yes. and, and we taught him how to how to fit it better so that it's e even more comfortable than it was pro before. I hope you've had a great time Fantastic this week. Time. Um, and I think this might bring us to a wrap. They are they are giving us funny looks so like Let's we need to get out of here. Uh, so well, all right. it was great to meet you. <laughs> it, was it was great to meet you, Jazz. <laughs> if, if you I... look vaguely familiar. <laughs>